It is uh, July 6th, 2014. Our message today is called Bleed to Bless. Uh, I am intentionally picking up on a, a gem that Tommy Hudson mined right out of the word. And if I understand correctly, he, he uh, was also instructed by Andrew Weiss, uh, New Testament word studies. And I just got to tell you, every once in a while you hear something and it explodes in your soul. It invades every area of you. Uh, other times it does that but it was already there and it just feels good to know men in other times and other places have seen it. There's something affirming because the world is trying to convince us we are crazy and half the time the worldly church is on their side. Um, this morning, bleed to bless is something that came directly out of his message and I believe will take us right through the sending off of Jacob. Turn with me to Numbers 6. I have preached on the Nazarite vow many times, so I do not intend to do it this morning. Having said that, I can't think about Jacob and not think about a Nazarite vow. Jacob was the very first time in my ministry career that we ever attempted a Gentile version of a Nazarite vow. Susan, do you have a picture of Jacob? Um, and I'm going to tell you, that's not actually the half of it at that time. <laughs> Jacob showed up in our midst somewhere around 2008. I think he was about 16. And uh, I wasn't sure whether he came to help us or steal from us. And um, we put him to work immediately because that's what we do with young men. And somebody should say amen to that. Amen. And it was not long. And we saw the character of Christ being formed in him. And over time, God got hold of Jacob's heart. And so one of the things we had done is we taught on this verse. Start with me in number six in verse one. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of separation to the Lord as a Nazarite, what kind of vow? A special vow. That Hebrew word is polal. It could be translated so many ways. One of the finest would be extraordinary or miraculous. If a man or woman wanted to go beyond what all of his peers in the faith were doing, if they wanted to say, Lord, we love you and we know what is required of us, but we want to go way beyond what is required, then they would take a Nazarite vow. Can you imagine how distinctive this was? So Jacob is walking around and he's letting it grow. Later, Cody did the same thing and our neighbors called and warned us that there was a strange man outside of our house. We said, that strange man is our son. Thank you very much. And it put a new shape on our relationship forever. I want to tell you, it's not strange to be distinct for the Lord. It's special. It's Paul all. It's extraordinary. It's miraculous even. This word shows up when it's describing the works of the Lord done in Egypt. A uh, special kinds of miracles are Paul all. Now, without teaching on the Nazarite vow this morning, let's just take this principle from it. It wasn't enough to be separated as the chosen people of God. It wasn't enough to just bring sacrifices. Some wanted to go further than everybody else. Let me ask you, what group are you in this morning? Because I'm proud to say Jacob wanted to go further than everybody else. So as an example for the church, a sermon example, Cassidy cut his hair in front of the entire church. And then we lit it on fire. While the Bible says this is a pleasing aroma, it caused most in the church to throw up. Again, a beautiful sermon example. What our flesh despises is often something God loves. It's God's love that I wanted to talk to you about as we begin today because I want to tell you how we send Jacob off. And not just Jacob, before him Gabe and Nick, before them uh, Zeke Lamb, before them uh, the Dime family. Why we send people off in ministry, why we do what we do, it's because of the love of Christ. Now. That Nazarite vow was special in so many ways. 
Things had to die. Things had to bleed. It cost so much money in the ancient world to do this that it'd be the equivalent of selling your house and cars. And then towards the end of the chapter, he says, and anything else you can afford. In other words, the call of God, the love of God, would always cost you all that you have. It's with that idea that I'm going to ask you to pick up in John 13. Say there when you were there. Now, when you get to John 13, slide your finger down to John 13 and verse 34. Let me ask you, did Jesus Christ ever tell a lie? No, see, I don't think Jesus Christ ever lied either. I think he's perfect in every way. And yet we have what would seem to be a contradiction in John 13, 34. It says, a new command I give you. Love one another. Is that a new command? In the first century in Israel, is it a new command to love one another? Leviticus 19 in the 18th verse commands the very same thing. In fact, could you put Leviticus 19, 18? Y'all stay in John 13. Look at this. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Does God tell us to love each other at least as far back as 1600 B.C.? Then how can Jesus Christ stand in the first century A.D. and say a new command I give you? Perhaps it's because of the way that he finishes this verse. As I have loved you. Nobody had ever demonstrated love in the way that Christ demonstrated love. In the past, to love each other, we didn't bear grudges. In the past, to love each other, we didn't harbor ill will. In the past, to love each other, we might let something else die for them. You might give a Passover lamb for some other member in your family. You might give a peace offering to make something right with someone. Something else may have to bleed. But in Christ, we learn a whole new way of love. He is the one who shed his blood to bless us. Now, he didn't say... I've set you an example that you should go talk about. This whole 13th chapter actually begins with the statement to show them the full extent of his love. He goes on to wash their feet. In other words, the full extent of his love, you can find that in John 13 and verse 1. The last part, now he showed them the full extent of his love. Now, full extent is pretty self-explanatory in English. This word is telos. It means the point of. This is why he loved them. He loved them to show them how to do something, which was imitate the way that he loved them. He modeled in everything that he did, discipleship. And how much did Jesus love us? Enough to bleed for us. Now, many of you are aware, having sat in church, many years, that there are a lot of Greek words for love. The one that is appearing here is agape. And it's the same one that shows up in John 3.16. So in John 3.16, when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, understand that this agape kind of love doesn't just bleed, it gives. It gives. How much do you love someone? You know, it's funny if you talk to a teenage boy, he loves someone. But he loves someone so much that he wants to take from them, not give to them. He loves so much that he wants to own, but he doesn't want to die for. However, by the time he matures to be a man standing at an altar, united to his bride in the way that we saw on Thursday night, the love has matured into one that doesn't want to take, it wants to give. It doesn't want to dominate, it wants to love and support. Christ modeled a love for his followers. And it was a love that bleeds and a love that gives. This is the same word, agape, the same way that it's used in Romans 5. In verse 5, turn with me there. Say there when you're there. There. I'm going to wait on the rest of you, so if you're sleeping, you're going to hold up the service. And don't be scared, but it is a small room. I will come find you. 
And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love, his agape, into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Understand that the love we're talking about now is not a love that you find in lost people. It's simply not there. It has to be given as a gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we move on to the next verse, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. What does this love do? This love looks past the person's condition as it stands now and gives all it can to make sure that their condition is changed. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? The kind of love that we want to send Jacob off is a sacrificial love. The kind that is willing to believe that he might benefit. Do you believe that submission ministries will benefit from having a young man there on fire for the Lord? I got to tell you, as a pastor, it's not such an easy thing to watch him grow from 16 to 22? 23. 23. And then give them away. When they show up, they often don't know all they're supposed to know. That's why God brought them. He brings to you people that you get to love and demonstrate love for and model it and model it and model it. And very often, just like you raising your children, they don't understand what you're doing for them. And about the time that they do get it and they begin to imitate it, the Holy Spirit decides that he wants to plant them somewhere else. Is there nobody that can feel our pain here this morning? Jacob is evangelizing at work. It's a witness to his boss, a witness to his friends. Jacob gives to the ministry generously. Jacob in every way works hard and serves. This is a model of what a young man is supposed to be in ministry. And it's not so easy to give a goat away. It's hard to give away a sheep that you love. And the reason that we do it is because it's exactly what Christ would do. Turn with me to Corinthians, the 13th chapter. People hang this on their wall, and I love what Brother Tommy said about it. He said, you know, one of the problems with Corinthians 13 is that we have accepted it as an exclusion for the gifts. We've accepted the idea that we could love as opposed to eagerly desire the gifts, and they were actually meant to complement each other. It was not an either or, Pastor Sutherland. It was an and and both. What a great message if you'd like to hear that sometime. I would submit to you today that the God kind of love cannot be displayed outside of the moving of the spiritual gifts. It is in and of itself a deposit from God. Look at this 13th chapter and pick up with me in verse 5. Say there when you were there. Amen. Speaking of what love is not, it is not rude and it is not... If it's not self-seeking, then it must be self sacrificing. How about this? By the time you get to the verse 7, what does it say? It speaks of always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, many of the husbands in the room can say, oh yeah, always protect. But can you say always trust? See, it's a very, very hard thing to take Anybody that you're responsible for, Eric just did it with a son, some of you have done it with your daughters, and trust that outside of your care, God is going to take care of them, right? But love always trusts because it is always sacrificial. It is never self-seeking. When speaking with a young minister here recently, he said, I just think that I would die if so-and-so left our church and came to that church. So well then you need to answer the question, young man. Do you have their best interest in mind or your best interest in mind? It stopped him in his tracks. He's had trouble thinking about it to this day. He said he'd get back to me on it. I will get back with him. We want God's will above every other. Can y'all say amen to that? Amen. This is what Brother Weiss said about the agape kind of love. It is, in its essence, a self-sacrificial love, a love that puts aside self in an effort to help and to bless others. Yes, a love that goes to the point of suffering, if that is necessary, to, in order to bless others. If you ever want to see what that looks like, 
Find somebody who gives their daughter away at a wedding that has labored to make sure she's pure before the Lord, has labored to make sure she's in love with the Lord, has labored day and night to make sure that she's a bride worth having. And you will know what kind of love this is. And for the highest kind of blessing, suffering is necessary. For we must bleed if we would bless. This is the love of God, not love for God, but the love which God is and which he provides through the operation of the Holy Spirit as a believer depends upon his ministry. Our hope, our endeavor, is that we would stretch out and see lives changed through a sacrificial demonstration of the gospel. That that life would grow to a place where it becomes part of a family and maybe even spawns its own family. And then they turn outwards to the nations. The day that we stop desiring to send people outward, we become stagnant and we cease to have a reason to exist because it is not God's kind of love. For that reason, it's appropriate to call LCMF a missions church. It's appropriate to call LCMF an evangelical church. It's appropriate to call us crazy if you want, but I want to ask, if you be in God's love, can there really be any other kind of church? When you look at Romans 12 in verse 9, we are given a command. This command is love must be sincere. I've heard many fine teachings on this word sincere. Uh, you may have heard that its etymology comes from sincere, meaning without wax, that it was an ancient Latin term. Of course, there is a word that lies beneath the English word sincere. And when we're thinking about that, thinking about the original language in which this is written in, it's important to understand that we're not talking about wax, we're not talking about pottery, we're not talking about that at all. The word is anupokokritos. Now, none of you will remember that later, and I had a hard time saying it this time, so don't be impressed. It literally means without hypocrisy. Your love must not be a counterfeit. It actually speaks of an ancient world where if someone is judging from underneath a mask, you cannot trust the judgment because you don't know who it is that is giving it. In other words, it's an unmasked, unveiled kind of love. In other words, one with no hidden motives. When we say love must be sincere, I want to tell you that we should state plainly what our intentions are towards each other. We should then make sure that our intentions have the other person's best interest in mind, even when it causes us to bleed. Can somebody in the house of God say amen? amen? Here is an example of a way in which Jesus said it. In John 14 and verse 29, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Is that plain speech? Could you say that there was anything hidden in his motives here? I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. Is that plain speech? He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. I would like to encourage you before we leave this part of the message about why we do what we do to consider this. The King of Kings put himself in a position to be attacked for the purpose of explaining what a sacrificial love is. And he said plainly beforehand what was going to happen and what the result of it would be. People learn that you love the Father when you look beyond your interest and look towards the interest of someone else. How many of you have been concerned about your calling? And if you lie, I'm going to call you out. So we better get some hands up in this room. There is a shifting place in every man's life, though. And it usually starts when you are having children. When you're no longer just concerned about your calling, you're concerned about theirs. And like a balancing scale that is at one time way out of proportion, it comes to a place of equilibrium in the middle of your life and then tilts heavily towards the child. And if that doesn't happen, then you are not walking in God's kind of love. 
At first, you dream of what you can accomplish for the Lord. Later on, you dream of what you can do together for the Lord. By the end of your life, you ought to be dreaming about them passing you up in the Lord in every possible way, or it's not God's love. Let me ask you, did Brother Hudson not read to us out of the Gospel of John, you will do greater things than these? The King of Kings demonstrated His love to us in a way that says, I love you so much I'll die for you. And then He allows us to become sons of God with Him. And then He says, after He is going to uh, go ascend, you will do greater things. This is a perfect model for a church to follow. You bend down to lift them up, you walk beside each other, and then they surpass you. This is the kind of why we do what we do, how we're going to send Jacob off. I would like to tell you that in this church, we don't just call ourselves a missions church because we give. We don't just call ourselves a missions church because we go. We're a missions church because we're instructed by the missionaries that have gone before us. My heroes are not dusty old theologians. My heroes are the men whose feet actually touched the ground and those who helped them get there. When I think on Hudson Taylor, I would like you to know two amazing things about his life. The first is at the end of his life, he could look back at the beginning of his life and see how far he had come. And when looking at it, he said something. He said, I learned from a pin prick while still in England how important the little things are. See, while he was doing an autopsy on a body that had typhoid fever, and he was only doing the autopsy because he hoped to learn some facts about medicine so that when he got to China, he wouldn't be completely inept. He received a pin prick that went through his glove. It almost killed him. It almost ended his ministry. We're often prepared for the full frontal assault from the enemy. And you say, like, I will never fall away. But you don't realize that it's one pinprick at a time that death comes. It's not an all-out assault. I'd like to tell you, Jacob, as you go, mind the little things. They're the ones that come back to get you. And I want to tell you, church, if you hope one day to take your stand, you stick out your chest, and you have all the bravado and machismo a man or woman can muster, and you think, in that day I'll rise to the occasion. If you don't face the little pinpricks that are trying to kill you now, you will never rise to the occasion in that day. Secondly, from Hudson Taylor, I would like to remind you of another biblical principle. Hudson, right before he left for China, was near starving. He was eating a loaf of bread a day and drinking a full glass of port wine. Whatever you may think about that, Hudson Taylor had no problem with it. That's what he had for food every day. He rationed it out to one loaf of bread and one glass of port wine a day. Any of you feeling guilty about what you ate on 4th of July at this point? He did that for two reasons. One is he was trying to save money because the gospel never goes forward without sacrifice. And the second is he had already given all he had and there was literally nothing left. It was in that condition he had what the United Kingdom called a half crown at the time. And while ministering to someone, the verse in James came to him. If you walk away and say, be warm and well fed and do nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? And he realized that the Lord wanted him to give away his half crown. He choked on it. It hurt him. But then we have to bleed to bless, don't we? He thought for a moment how he might make change, but there was no smaller denomination available. He thought for a moment if he could maybe loan them the half crown. And then he came to the sacrifice. And he gave them his half crown. Hudson Taylor at the end of his life said, the cost is always a half crown. You ask me how? He had given away millions of pounds later. How could a half of a crown, equivalent to a quarter, how could the cost always be a quarter? The cost was not the half crown. The cost is always what you have. It will always cost you 
what you have. I want to tell you in this ministry, there is not a single thing that we value more than those for whom we see Christ being formed in. I would sooner be, it would be easier for me to give away $50,000 than it is for me to watch a life thoroughly inundated with the gospel and equipped for every good work, walk out the door, and yet that's the price and that's the cost. So, Eric, you can only say that because you don't have $50,000. We have neither. <laughs> Whatever it costs, it's worth it. Because what we have observed in our earliest disciples that have since gone out is they are making disciples. And the king is getting his increase. Many of you have heard the name Mandy Wakefield, now Mandy Dime. Her birthday was 4th of July, and she sent me a gift. So, oh, pastor, you like to receive gifts. You haven't heard what kind yet. She sent me a song that a disciple of theirs wrote about loving him so much you give it all. And I noticed the name and realized she didn't have a guitar, the girl who was playing a guitar. And I wondered, and the reason the girl is writing worship songs to Jesus is Mandy had given her the guitar, her guitar, her favorite guitar, the one we watched her save for months to buy and her proudest possession during the time she was here. And this is how the gospel rolls forward. Say, well, Pastor, there's a lot of people that are doing it without bleeding. They get a corporate sponsor. They get a corporate donor. I've had all the corporate sponsors I want. It's the corporate body of Christ who is supposed to sponsor the work of Christ. Yeah. How dare us raise money like the Mormons do? It's not a compulsory tax. We want those who want to bleed to bless. And God will do more with our little than he will do with their masses. One quick story before we move on to why we are sending Jacob off instead of how were the manner. There was a time period in this church where we wanted to go to Mexico for Christmas. Now it's a given that we go to Mexico for Christmas, isn't it? How many of you have been in Mexico at Christmas with this church? Look around. You people are crazy. Don't you know there's cartel there? How many of you have been on a trip where guns were pulled out while we were in Mexico? Look around. What, are y'all crazy? Yes. How many of you have seen guns put to the head of your friends on trips in Mexico? You know what? We may not meet in the compact center, but I'll take those odds anywhere. It's a different kind of faith. And you know what? What we learned about our very first trip to Mexico at Christmas time was that if you fast from Thanksgiving to Christmas, the money that you raise is multiplied many, many, many times over. I've had far more money on many other trips, but I've never had any that went further than that trip. When you are willing to bleed, it blesses other people. Somebody say amen so we can move on. Yeah. I didn't tell you about William Carey, and I'm going to have to now. You have different temptations early in your life than you do later in your life. Early in your life, it might be about giving away your half crown, Jacob. It might be very hard for you to walk away from something you've become dear to here. Trusting that the Lord will bring it back to you. It's difficult to know what to do. Later in your life, it might be very hard to set aside the prestige of what you've accomplished. William Carey built colleges in India, and he was one of the first Christians ever there. He built printing presses in India and printed the very first Bibles in the Bengali language ever. His factories were burned to the ground on more than one occasion, and he persevered. You could learn so many things from William Carey, but it was in the last day of his life that I learned the most from him. A young man came. I said, I wanted to learn about the great William Carey. See, I'm going to start a work just like yours. I'm going to do what you did and do it in a different region. That's a goal, isn't it? That's great. He discoursed for William while he was laying there dying. 
The second to last day of William's life, he still had time for other people. That's special. Laying there dying, William finally interrupted him and said, Today, son, you have spoken much of William Carey. I shall soon die. And I say, speak no more of William Carey. Speak only of his Savior. What great advice. I believe that this young man that we're sending off today, like so many of you in here, is going to do great things. And yet the day will pass, and we will no longer speak of the great things they did. We will only speak of the Savior that caused them to do those great things. We don't glory in the blood that we shed to bless others. We glory in the one who shed his blood to teach us to do it. Amen? Turn with me to Acts 5, Acts 6, 6, 5. Get my tongue untied here. We send off Jacob because it's what the Lord has instructed us to do. Why we send off Jacob in particular? Well, we can find these attributes in the sixth chapter of Acts in verse 5. The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What an interesting thing. This is widely renowned as the choosing of the seven. The seven considered to be deacons or servants in the early church. And when we think of these men, Stephen becomes the first martyr. Philip becomes a great evangelist. You have to ask yourself, what was the requirement? There were two. To be full of faith and to be full of the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to be full of faith because you won't have the power to carry it out. It's not enough to simply say that you're full of the Spirit. A man can be led by many things. How would you know it's the right Spirit? We worship in Spirit and truth. We're full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. What kind of circumstances did these men get appointed to their high position? A time of trouble in the church. What was the trouble? It's the same trouble that's in every church. Some in the church thought they were being overlooked and others were being blessed. There was the beginning of a schism in the church. Do you remember what it was? Some were Hebraic-speaking Jews and their widows were being taken care of, but the Greek-speaking Jews thought that their widows were not being looked after. One of the things that I love about the picking of Philip here, the very reason he was despised is the reason that he was picked. Follow me here. The Greeks were looked down on because they were not authentically Hebraic. So those who grew up in Israel saw themselves as better. Those who grew up in Jerusalem knew they were better. And the Greek-speaking, compromising Jews were a faction that was looked down upon. So the problem had a solution. The very one who was despised, if he's filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with faith, would be the answer to the problem. So when you find a 16-year-old wandering around on the street at night, he may look like the problem, and he is in fact the answer to the problem. Because when Jesus fills him with faith and fills him with the Holy Ghost, the world begins to take notice. Maybe we've looked, and Jacob is certainly pretty, but maybe we've looked for the pretty ones too hard. Maybe the athletes and the well-spoken is not quite what God is after. Do you know what we called the FCA in our school? The Fellowship of Carnal Athletes. You know why? Because I was their leader and I was not born again. When you find someone who has nothing except an empty vessel, then when it's filled, everyone takes note. Can somebody say we got no empty vessels in the room? Is there an amen out there? Anybody that feels a little downcast, a little looked over, a little forgotten. 
Oh, the very problem might be pointing to the solution. When you fill somebody like that with hope and anticipation and a fervency for Christ, everyone takes note. I say Philip was picked because he was despised, not because he was esteemed. How interesting is it that in the church we esteem things men despise and we despise things men esteem. That's another attribute of God's love. Look at Acts 8 with me. Say there when you were there. In Acts 8, let's pick up in the first verse. Let's see, Jacob, what are your job qualifications? Well, I'm full of the Holy Ghost and I'm full of faith. Oh, well, then you'll have an easy life because that's where faith is displayed the best, right? Just the land of blessings. This is what the pimps on TV are telling everyone. The truth is, faith is displayed the best in the midst of adversity. In the eighth chapter and first verse, and Saul was there giving approval to his death, speaking of Stephen, the friend of Philip. On that day, a great persecution. Somebody say great. great. When can you call persecution great? Is it great because of the magnitude? Is it great because of the duration? Or is it great because you survived it? Is it great because it was devastating beyond any other? Or is it great because what came out of it was refined more than any other? What makes it great? Great means so many different things to different people, doesn't it? I say it's great because it set them to accomplishing the purpose of the gospel, leaving Jerusalem and going to the nations. Sometimes it takes a little thorn in the nest. In this case, it's good when it's all voluntary, isn't it? Wouldn't it be better if you didn't have to be stabbed to get you to turn? Yes. Yes. Hmm? Nice. I'm not going to preach about burning barley fields today, but if the king of Israel has to light your fields on fire to get you to come meet with him, then you must not esteem him as king very much, huh? We ought to be looking for a chance to do his will. So a great persecution breaks out. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. What is it to mourn deeply? How many of you have lost a close friend? Would you consider it your finest hour? Most of us would not. See, those who are full of faith, those who are full of the Holy Spirit, we're called to the hour that is usually not men's finest hour. It's when our friends die and things are going wrong that we rise to the occasion. But Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. By the way, this word scattered... It's not diaspora, as in the Jews of the diaspora who were scattered all over the wor world. It's diaspora. Slightly different pronunciation. You say, what difference does it make? If you're diaspora, they're scattered everywhere without intention. They're just all over the place. When they're diaspora, it's more like throwing the little ping pong balls in the number cup you're supposed to throw them. The Holy Spirit picks up those who are full of Him, who are full of faith, and He tosses them into the right position. Are you willing to be uprooted? Are you willing to go where he says go? Or have you decided that your comfort is more important than his calling? Philip was one of those who experienced the diaspora. And he preached wherever he went. When Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there, What's exciting about Philip preaching in Samaria? The same thing that's exciting about Jacob going to Washington, D.C. Is Jacob the first from our number to go to Washington, D.C.? Who's there? What's Zeke doing there? He's planting a church and preparing the way. Had anybody ever been to Samaria before? Not one of the apostles. Not one of them were sent there. Not one of the uh, deacons, 
Nobody who's called an evangelist, none of the five-fold ministry have ever been there until Philip dons the doors of Samaria. But who had been where no other had ever gone? Jesus Christ had been and prepared the ground. He had a conversation with a woman of little reputation, did he not? And the day that she heard from the king of kings, what did the one who was despised go and do? Told everybody she knew. So from the day that Jesus left there to the day that Philip shows up, as far as we know, they're still waiting in eager anticipation. And no one has dared to go except one man who's full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. So it is, is it any surprise what happens? When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what was said. Has Jesus prepared a field, a field that is simply waiting on you? Isn't that a question that's worth asking? And what are you doing while the field awaits its worker? See, if we're praying, if we're softening the ground, if we're raising up whatever Nazarite vow it might take to support the work there, then we can be sure when we get there, Jesus will have fulfilled his end. You know, Matthew 28, 19 said, go into all the world, and they had not even left Jerusalem yet, and most people estimate this to be 10 years after the resurrection. And Philip is the first to go to Samaria. Somebody who was picked because he was a Greek-speaking Jew and not a Hebrew-speaking Jew. Somebody picked with the high task in mind of handing out bread. This is one of the things that I love about the young men in our church. We work them. We work them hard. And, said, so man, it's almost like slave labor force. No young men say amen? What are y'all doing? You just work them hard. We believe that while they learn to hand out bread, they will learn to hand out heavenly bread. While they develop a work ethic in this room and a work ethic on every moving crew that has blessed nearly every family in this church, on every cleaning crew that blesses us all twice a week, they learn what it is to labor before the Lord. And He meets them in that labor. They preached everywhere they went. Now Philip is preaching in the field that Christ himself prepared. Why had no one been to Samaria? They were half-breeds. They were despised. They were nearly as bad as Gentiles. If you're, in case you're wondering, that's you people. No one went because why would you go? But if you were picked because you were despised and you saw what God did in your life, how can you then look at others and judge them according to the flesh? You see what a man can become in Christ. Why was Philip the first to go? Because he understood what they were like. He understood what God could do in them. Why had the others overlooked it? Well, maybe they were very privileged. They had walked with Jesus such a long time, you know. But then... Who's walking more closely with Jesus, I wonder? When Philip gets there, what does he do? It's in the next verse. There it is. Okay. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. You know, the seventh verse of the eighth chapter reminds me of the seventh verse of Matthew 10. In Matthew 10, it says, Go, preach the kingdom. In the eighth verse, it says... Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. It came to you as a bleeding blessing. And now even if you have to bleed, you have to go bless because it came to you without cost. Now you go give it to them without cost to who? Them, but it's at great cost to you. The gospel will always require your death to give life to other people. And a gospel that doesn't require you to die doesn't give them much life. That's what's wrong with health, wealth, and success. I would say that if the gospel 
heals the sick, raises the dead, cleanses those with leprosy, and drives out demons. Little Philip's doing pretty good because he's not called an apostle. He's not really been referred to as anything other than a deacon, and here soon he'll be called an evangelist, and he's already healing the sick and driving out demons. I would say two of four is pretty good. How are you doing on that scorecard? Like, if we got to define your life, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing those with leprosy, and casting out demons... If those were the four categories to excel in, did you notice dry theology is not in there anywhere? Statement of faith not in there anywhere? If those were the four categories, could we say that we should greatly esteem Stephen? You know what I think is maybe the most amazing statement about Stephen? It's verse 8. In verse 8, so there was great... So there was great joy. We're going to keep doing it. So there was great joy. You want to know what the mark of real conversion is? It's not great theology. It's not great church attendance. It's not great buildings or great men. It's great joy. Stephen went to a place that was known for idolatry. And after he had been there for three verses, it was known for great joy. Oh, man, what can God do with an undesirable? He can take a city full of idols and turn it into a city known for great joy. You want to see the goal? Let, let, let me ask you. If we're reading a Pauline epistle, let's just for a moment say that it's Galatians. When there was a serious theological problem to the point where men were going to fall away from Christ, do you remember what clued Paul into it? You were running such a good race. What happened? Who cut in on you? Where has all of your joy gone? One of the things that I'm proudest about Jacob is that he was not normally a happy-go-lucky guy. He was quiet, contemplative, and occasionally melancholy. But as the gospel invaded his life, it's hard to picture him without a smile now. And I'm confident that if you plant him in another workplace, even if he's just leaving the death of a friend, because he's full of the Holy Ghost and because he's full of faith, I think the workplace will be full of joy and it'll be a testimony. I think as he preaches the kingdom, demons will run and sick will be healed. Look at verse 9. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. Maybe that's the other reason no one went. He boasted that he was someone great, don't they always? And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had been amazing them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and of the name of Jesus Christ, what did he preach? He preached about God's reign on the earth and the name, character, body of work, authority of Jesus. They were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he, what's that word say? Followed Philip everywhere. Now, Everybody heard Matthew 28, 19. Going to all of the nations, you're going to baptize them, you're going to teach them to obey, you're going to make disciples, right? Yes. But this is the first time we see anyone outside of Jerusalem who has preached the word, demonstrated it with power, baptized people, and what are they doing? Following him everywhere. It's discipleship. He's the first one who's making disciples outside of Jerusalem. And why was he picked? Because he was a part of the lower class. What was he picked to do? Oh, to hand out bread. It's still not why I love him the most. Check this out. Pick up with me in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, what did they hear in Jerusalem? The work's already done. 
What did they hear in Jerusalem? Evangelism's already taken place. They sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. What an interesting thing. We have apostles coming all the way from Jerusalem to invade the work that Philip is doing. Was Philip inadequate? He's the first to go to Samaria. He's the first to see miracles accompany his preaching outside of Jerusalem. He's the first to baptize people in the name of Jesus outside of Jerusalem. And they're not yet filled with the Holy Ghost. I think Philip was smart enough to leave room for his brothers in his work. And I don't see a hint of competition between him and the apostles. It doesn't say they showed up and threw him out, and it doesn't say he protested. If you've worked hard for something and somebody else comes in right just to run the ball across the finish line, how do you feel? See, but then Philip was probably just graciously happy that he was chosen to hand out bread. Think of where he started. He was happy for what the Lord had accomplished through him, not jealous of what the Lord didn't let him do and gave to someone else to do. Come on, church, tell me that's not a preachable word. See, we're all called to do something. But knowing where the calling begins and ends and leaves room for your brothers, that takes serious maturity. We live in the land of the one-man show. We're not called out in pairs of two anymore. When we plant churches, we put one big name on the sign. It's about a great man, a great building, and a great day for a great fee. And it's sickening. We ought to know what it is we're called to do, and we ought to invite others to come do the very thing that we're short in. We ought to know where the limits of our ministry are and invite others that complement what we're doing. Amen. Jacob is not going to win Washington, D.C. by himself. He couldn't, he shouldn't, and he wouldn't. He's going to join with others that will complement the work. In fact, he wants to be a complement in their work. Can somebody say amen in the house of God? Amen. Get with me to Acts 8 in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. <laughs> How many of you would like to be in Jerusalem headed for Gaza right now? <laughs> Listen carefully, not just in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, headed for Gaza. That's probably not the most exciting destination on the planet at the moment. It seems as if Philip is always being sent where Maybe the others have not been so anxious to go. You know, Gaza's on the way to Egypt. Where are you at, Ibrahim? It's on the way to Egypt. It's on the way to Ethiopia. It's on the way to Northern Africa. It's on the way to the other giant continents of the world. God always has Philip reaching out to other people. Philip understood his life was not about himself. Maybe that's why he left that work for Peter and John. He knew what he was called to do and what he was not called to do. Do you see yourself as a one-man show? Some of you in here don't think you have a place in the body of Christ. Occasionally, there are some in here that only see their place in the body of Christ. I want to encourage you to make room for those that are around you. We need each other's help. We need it. There is no spot on the bench in the kingdom of God. It doesn't exist. You cannot sit on your salvation, warm your hands, and get stronger for the next battle. That's not how it works. You get stronger while you are doing what God tells you to do. And the revelation that you brought into the room is just as needed as any revelation anyone else already has in the room. And if you don't share it, what about us? So let's put false humility away and let's be who God called us to be. Amen? Amen? Look at verse 29 through 30 here. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. <laughs> 
Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. Okay, I know the way I've preached this a thousand times, maybe not a thousand, but at least 300 times, is Philip heard from God, he took off and he ran, and he arrives at the chariot just in time to see Nolan reading from Isaiah 53. Is that how you read it? That's how I've always read it. What did the Spirit say to him? He said, go to the chariot and stay near it. I want to get this in your head for just a second. It hit me in a whole new way today. It's important to run when God says run. I mean, it is important to waste no time and get there. And then what does he have to do right when he gets there? Stay there. We have no idea how long between his arrival and he prompts the question, oh, what you reading? The guy's traveling in a caravan. He is a member of a royal household. Probably was not so easy just to walk up to. There could have been over 100 people in that caravan. He ran because God said go. He wasted no time, but he also stayed until the mission was done. Some of you have no problem running. Get an amen, Michael? Amen. Some of you have no problem staying. Can you run when God says run and stay when he says stay and appreciate the difference between them? One of the things that I love in Jacob... Jacob had trouble learning to run immediately. But then he mastered it. He started doing what God said when he said do it. And he had a very needed component. Staying power. He didn't just run and then give up when it got hard. You know, I've noticed that a lot of those that came in around the time he came in, they never stuck to anything in their lives. Still haven't. They came in, they got blessed, and they took off. Jacob ran to the presence of God and then stayed in the presence of God. So consequently, his life is not going to look like a roller coaster. It's going to look like a steady spiritual incline. We need to learn to run when God says run, but stay when he says stay until the job's done. You can get addicted to running. It doesn't look like I've ever been addicted to running, but I have. You know, this great thing happens when you run. There's a release of endorphins. After about the third mile, you go into what's called a runner's numb. And it's a little bit like a high. By the fifth or sixth mile, it can really be glorious. There are times in my life I was running five and six miles every day. It was harder not to run than it was to run because... Then it was harder not to run than it was to run because my body craved it. My digestive system didn't work when I didn't run. I wasn't hungry. Nothing worked right unless I was running. And some Christians are like that. What is the Lord saying to you now? What is the Lord saying to you now? What is the Lord saying to you now? And it sounds spiritual enough, but they never complete the race. Are you hearing me? For us, the direction is only forward. We run to the spot he says go to, and we stay there until the work is done. I know that when we send Jacob... To Washington DC Jacob won't get a new vision inside of 30 days and leave he is running to where God has told him and he will stay until God releases him can we get an amen in the house amen. it is neither godly to stay when he says run nor is it godly to run when he says stay we need to learn to run and to stay <coughs> amen maybe the last thing that we are to pick up from this could be found around verse mm, 35. Are you with me in 35? Somebody say, I'm there. Yeah. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Was he just lucky? Did, did the Ethiopian eunuch happen to be reading the one passage of Scripture that Philip knew? Can I see your Bible, Jacob? So if I pick up your Bible and I walked up here with it, would I find a single verse that had been cried over, poured over? Because we probably have 60 markers in this Bible for passages 
They've been cried over, prayed over, yearned over. Do you know that Paul told Timothy to study, to show himself approved by God, a man who rightly handles the Word of God? Do you think Philip was just lucky, or do you think it didn't matter what passage the Ethiopian was, was reading? Philip could have picked up with any of them. See, he had learned to run, and he had learned to stay. He had also studied the Word of God to be prepared. So many want to run, but they wouldn't have anything to give when they got there. So many want to stay, but you've stayed so long that you've exhausted what you have and God will not give you more until you move from that spot. This is a living, breathing relationship. It is not one that is stagnant, and it can never be one that is stagnant. I want to encourage you to move quickly when God says to move, and then to be persevering in what He's called you to do, and then to be prepared during the time between your calling and now. Is that a fair word? 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Have you ever been standing in a God-ordained situation and you drew a blank and it hurt? I have. I've done it from this pulpit. You want to correctly handle the Word of God. Some of your zeal needs to be matched with knowledge. And some of you that are so full of knowledge have depleted your zeal a decade ago. It's time to learn to run and to stay. Our last passage that I am just dying to share with you, it took restraint to wait this long, is what happens with Philip. Turn with me to Acts 21. In Acts 21, pick up with me in verse 8. Are you with me? Yes. A few of you. Are you with me? Yes. In the back, are you with me? Sama, are you with me? Speak. Speak, Sama. You can say it in Arabic. He's with me. <laughs> Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea, and we stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven who had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. God has seen Philip's diligence handing out bread. And because he handed out natural provision and did it with a godly heart, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith, even when it was bread, God sent him as the first evangelist to Samaria. And because he not only saw conversions but discipled them, and then transition the work to his brothers who needed the help. They needed to be able to help him because he left room for them. The Spirit of God picked him up and sent him to an entirely new city to do it again. And I bet when that was over, he did it again until God had built in this one life a family. You know, his daughters are famous in history. Philip and his unmarried daughters and his wife are supposed to have been killed outside of Heropolis after having preached for many years in Caesarea. The story of their death inspired the first century Christians. There was a gate to a man named Domitian. And it said, all who pass under this gate acknowledge that Domitian is both Lord and God. And one day Philip was walking under it and he stopped. And he was so full of the Holy Spirit and so full of faith that his spirit simply said, I can't, I can't walk as everybody else walks. I can't go under this gate like everyone else. I know everybody's passing under it and they don't really believe it, but I can't do it. And they crucified Philip on the gate. Well, he encouraged his family to stay true to the faith. See, Philip, Philip had somebody bleed to bless him. And he was willing to bleed to bless others. So God gave him a family and showed them how. It starts with one family, friends, and then it moves. I'm sorry, it starts with one man, and then it moves to one family. 
You know who the first person to pave the way to reach the nations was in all of the Gospels when it comes down to it? It's none of the apostles. It was Philip the deacon turned evangelist because he's the first one that started the process of going. I love these undesirable men. There's something we could know for sure. If you've ever read verses 10 through, say, 15, you find out that Agabus, who is a prophet, shows up, and Agabus and Luke and Timothy and Silas all have a spirit-filled prayer meeting at Philip's house. And Paul's got to go on to Jerusalem, but they know he's going to die. And together as a group, many tried to dissuade him from going. But Paul could not be dissuaded, and he carried the gospel from there to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to Rome to the known world. You know what Philip's house was filled with? A company of great men. He didn't compete with Peter and John over the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He knew where his limits were. He didn't hesitate to go preach the word to Samaria when the Lord said, even though his only official sanctioned job was to hand out bread. And because he had done it right in the little things, God filled his house with the greatest men that the Bible ever produced or spoke of. And it goes down in history as our first cross-cultural evangelist. This is why we do what we do, friends. And I'm going to tell you the truth. It's going to hurt a little bit to see him go. I love him. And I love Zeke. And I love those other ministries. But that's not why we do it. We do it because we love Jesus. And he has given us that kind of love and told us to display it. Jacob, could you come up here? Could we have the elders come up here? I asked the elders if they would share a word with Jacob. Jacob has got family. He's got a mama. He's got brothers. He's got a sister, and he loves them all very much. But God brought him into the family of God in a different way for us. He's lived in our houses. He's uh, become like a son or a brother to us. And I wanted them to be able to share with him. Amen? Somebody gave me the microphone first, so I guess I'll be the first. I want to tell a quick Jacob story. Uh, I'm a mariner, and in the United States, it goes from Alaska down to the West Coast, the Gulf Coast, the East Coast. There's a couple hundred thousand of us. We're very weird people. We'll go out to where there's no land in very rough places. We're very independent, self-motivated. You have to be different to go do that. It's not something everybody wants to do. And so um, I was at a, a business the other day. I was consulting with some guys, and they were having some trouble and it was 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody was gone. I was talking to one of the leaders of the company. And a chaplain from the Siemens Church showed up because one of their young mariners, 24-year-old guy, had died. And so the chaplain from the Siemens Church, who, God bless them, they get out there and they try to bring the word and try to comfort mariners, had come to this business, and they were going to flag a, fly a flag on the company's flagpole and then give it to the parents of the, the young man who had died as a service, as a memorial. So we're sitting there talking. And he said, uh, I said, so, so how's, that, how's that working out? It's a pretty tough job being the chaplain for Mariners, right? He says, yeah, you know, it's really hard for these young people. I said, man, I know it is. We had a young guy showed up at our church one day and started helping and um, then he decided his family was moving, and he decided he wanted to stay, so he stayed with us for a while. And after a while, he came to me, and he said, what is it that you do? You know, what do you do? I told him what I did. He said, I want to do that. I said, okay, here's the deal. I'll give you a good recommendation. You go, and you do what they say if you get the job. But you put in two years at it, 
and you do everything they tell you to do perfectly, or you and me are going to have some problems. And so the young man said, okay. And he went and did it, joined a company up in Vicksburg, Mississippi. They loved him. He did a great job. And two years later, he came to me and he said, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, I have to quit. I said, well, that's a problem. Because the people where you work really like you a lot. They're, they, got, they tell me all the time, they got big plans for you. They love you. He said, yeah, but I can't keep my salvation working on this boat. There's pornography. There's language. There's all this stuff. I can't keep my salvation. And the pastor looked at me. He said, was his name Jacob? I said, as a matter of fact, yes, it is. Jacob had already had that conversation with the chaplain walking down the levee in Vicksburg, Mississippi. They talked about how hard it is for a young man with Christian conviction to work in an area where it's just filled with things that will tear you apart. His witness was strong where he went. He kept his word where Amen. he went. Amen. The people in the industry knew his witness. He kept his word and he kept his witness. He did what he said he would do. He stood where he should stand and his witness is still out there. I want to, before we commit Jacob to his new journey, I want to say how proud I am of him. Amen. Because he stood as a man should stand. He did what a Christian man does. And now he's even doing something bigger. Yeah. He's going down the road. He's going to knock some giants in the head. He's got a sling full of rocks out there somewhere in that truck out there. Jacob, did you achieve the license for Tankerman? Was that about as much money as you had ever made in your life? Yeah. He set out to do what he was told to do what he set his heart and believed was God's will, made more money than he had ever made in his life in doing it, and he walked away from it because he believed it was more beneficial for the kingdom of God. Is that a learning to bleed to bless? Amen. Amen. I'd like to mention three types of people. One is a born servant. One is a born leader, and the other is one who thinks he was born a leader. <laughs> we all know some of those, right? You know, God can take a born servant from the shepherd's field to the palace. Of course, he has to kill a few bears, lions, and uh, giants on the way. But he can't put a born leader to work until he has made him a servant. And we see that with Paul and Moses and even Joseph. God made them a servant before he could use them. But we all know, and those of us that know Jacob, is born a servant. Amen. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he... <laughs> He, he loves to serve and help people. Sometimes that's gotten him in trouble. <laughs> Sometimes when he makes a commitment to, to help someone and serve someone, someone else comes right along. And he's, just because he's there, oh, I'm going to help him. Gotten him in trouble a few times. But you know, he's learned and he overcome some things. And God speaks to this young man and given him some profound... Uh, words from time to time. And, and I kind of chuckle at some of these things. They go, boy. Like, he says, uh, I can't remember very many of them, but one is that everyone says they want to raise the dead, but nobody wants to walk in the graveyard. Huh? That's profound. God's given them the words. And if we look in the first song, the uh, first verse. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinner, or sit in the seat of the mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted 
by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he promises. Amen. Bless you. Amen. Amen. Uh, Jacob, I just have a passage for you out of Jeremiah, just as we were praying this morning. It says, the word of the Lord came to me. Obviously, this is for Jeremiah specifically, but I think it is very appropriate for this situation as well. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, and I think this is what the Lord is saying to you, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Amen. It says, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. And I believe that your time here at this church has literally been the fulfillment of this passage. Don't be afraid of what you're going to say. Don't be afraid of where you're going. It's literally that God has reached out and he's touched your mouth. Amen. And he has put his words within you. You will be incredibly successful because his, he's directing you. He's instructing you, and you're simply obeying. Amen. The pressure and the weight of this is really on the Lord. Yeah. It's not on you. Amen. Your pressure here is to just be obedient, to be full of faith, and to be full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I can't say how timely or how apt <clears throat> that word that Wade gave you was out of Jeremiah. Do you remember when the first trip that you made to Mexico, and we traveled out to the islands, right? So we tell everyone when we travel to Mexico, be prepared to have a testimony, a word to share. We're going there to contribute spiritual food in addition to natural food. So everyone, you know, they're riding in the boat and enjoying the scenery, but you can see there's, you know, this stone cold look on Jacob's face. And at first I'm thinking, well, surely he knows how to swim. But that wasn't it. Jacob was concerned about the words that would come out of his mouth. And he was contemplating what that testimony would be. And if there could be an awkward moment, it soon came when we got off that boat. So we get in front of uh, about 20 villagers there on the islands of Mexico. And uh, a guy that's with us said, hey, Jacob, you have a testimony to share. We'll translate. <laughs> Jacob, you got something? <laughs> Oh, how this man has grown since that time forward. Amen. 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 But from the first day that he walked into our church, it was actually, I think, near midnight, and I, I thought the recession had been so bad that the comedian Carrot Top was now looking for work. <laughs> and Jacob walked through those doors, and uh, I was one of the first couple ones. <laughs> there it is, right there. There it is. Jacob walked through those doors, and truly that statement that God founded this ministry on, changing one life at a time, jumped right in front of us at that moment. Here's an opportunity to apply the gospel and see one life changed. And where God has brought you to today, I found something. First Chronicles 12, starting at verse 22. Sure. Day after day, men came to help David until he had a great army, like the army of God. Further down, he describes the tribe of Zebulun. Men of Zebulun, experienced soldiers prepared for battle with every type of weapon to help David with undivided loyalty. This is who you are. What God did by bringing you through those doors originally was to prepare you for battle with every type of weapon. But what allowed us to contribute that to your heart was an undivided loyalty on your part. All these were fighting men who volunteered to serve in the ranks. They came to Hebron fully determined to make David king of over all Israel. Amen. So we're going to send you out to join the family of God that exists where Zeke is. We can see in your heart and your life and can bear witness that you're prepared for battle 
and that you're fully determined. So, brother, we bless you. We thank you for being a blessing to us. Amen. Amen. Could we stand to our feet?